school. Well, it's three past. So I think what I'm going to do is just get started. And um, I am very interruptible. So if you have questions as we're going, you're welcome to do that. Um, but I um, was looking at a lot of different materials, and I think that this is an important topic. So we know how much mo um, emotions affect learning. And we know that the syllabus is sort of the first contact for a student with uh, the professor and the course. So the tone and the presentation of the syllabus kind of really matters a lot more than I think we all give it credit for. And our first job as faculty is to see our students succeed. And that includes creating an environment where they are more likely to do the hard work of learning because learning is work. It's change and change is awkward and uncomfortable and it takes motivation and learning and support. So a motivational, a welcoming syllabus can really sort of set the guidelines, set everybody up for success. So that's the idea. And the nice thing about this is unlike a pandemic, you can work on your syllabus over time. You can make a few changes try it out, make a few more changes. You don't have to do it all at once like we just did this last year. So that's a nice plus. So first, okay, how do I get, there we go. Um, these are some other reasons why I wanted to do this now. We do have a transitional fall semester coming. There's going to be students. We have no idea what they've been able to absorb over the last year, what their situations have been like, uh, whether or not they feel confident enough to do this. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are things we always need to think about, and a motivational and welcoming syllabus can uh, assist with that. And again, uh, learning is a social and emotional process, as well as a cognitive one, and that requires hard work. So we're going to go over, I just want to contextualize syllabi in general. I'm going to talk about motivational welcoming language and you, how we use language in student learning outcomes. And then I'm going to introduce some things to include and some suggestions on that language and then aligning assessments with learning outcomes. So these are things we know. Syllabus is used to communicate with students. It gives the students an overview. It clarifies uh, process and teaching methods. It helps us plan. I don't know about you, but that really gives me an overview. I find a syllabus actually really helpful, but it also helps us to clarify learning outcomes. We should clarify um, strategies for accomplishing goals. And then of course, it helps us design and show the schedule, like sort of the, the arc of the course. But it can also become a really useful guiding document for students and have a lot of information about how they can succeed. This is stuff, again, we know. What goes, the core things in a syllabus, course information, description, schedule, assignments, evaluation, policies, college policy links. And I do want to remind folks that we we do have that ADA compliant template available. It's actually on the Faculty Center website, and I think it's also on the TLTC website. And that's a really great, you don't have to use everything in there if it isn't appropriate to your course, but it is ADA compliant when you put information in, and that's an important aspect to syllabi. Now, if we want to really create a welcoming motivational syllabus, start it not so much with a course description, but a hello, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, learning outcomes should be verbs and put in student-centered language. And this, when I started working on this a, a little over a year ago, this was news to me. I used to use the learning outcomes that were um, sort of standard, and I realized that they weren't very clear and they really didn't center the student as the person who was doing the activity. The purpose of and the details for projects and assignments, not just these are the projects, but why are we doing this? Contextualize what we're doing and why we're doing it. Grading rubrics should be in there so students understand why they're being graded. And I found once I started using rubrics better, 
<laughs> I don't get questions about grades. So that was very helpful. And just encouragement. You know, the language we use matters. Um, setting appropriate standards for the course because a 100 level course has different standards than a 200 or a 300 or a 400 level course. And you, the language in there should make it clear that this, that the students, these are my expectations for you, but I also think you can do this. If you work hard, this is possible. It requires work, but I, you know, I think we're ready to do this. And then, yeah, links for support on campus, ways to contact you, and really taking your time, like I keep saying, with the language that you use. All right, so some suggestions on supportive language. And I've been collecting these, and there's probably more that other people. The last session at 11 o'clock, some people had some really good ideas about um, ways to describe things or label things that um, are supportive. So calling things off, instead of calling them office hours, uh-oh, cat tangle, um, calling them student hours. There are first generation students for whom office hours mean, office hours mean it's time for the, the faculty to work in their office. They don't get that it's time for them to connect with you in your office. And we can't assume that students know this. So calling them um, student hours is really a smart idea. Course plans or course of values as opposed to course policies. And that can also say, this is, again, it's centering the student. We're creating a community here, people who are working together. Um, a welcome to the course, like I said. My hope for you is, please contact me if. Um, and then a, a something that regarding uh, people's names, gender identity, and here's some suggested language. I'll, I will gladly honor your request to address you by an alternate name or gender pronoun. Please advise me accordingly early in the semester so I can make appropriate changes to my records. And for me, I write out phonetic <laughs> pronunciations of names because I need to hear it correctly and then say it correctly. And I, that really matters to people, uh, to all of us, students, adults, anyone to get someone's name right is a real show of respect. And then, you know, we all went into this stuff because we liked it. We shouldn't be afraid to show our interest in um, and our enthusiasm for our subject matter. Good grief. Like, that's cool. All right. So here are some other ideas to change the language of your syllabus. Instead of you are allowed to, you can say you are welcome to. I only accept. Uh, how about I encourage you to do this? You'd also want to put in why. Late re work receives a 40% reduction. Late work is eligible for 60% of the original points. That gives somebody, okay, I'm only gonna get 60 points. Maybe I should get this in on time, okay? I hope you actively participate. I've found this is the best way for you to engage in learning. That's very different than come prepared. You must complete makeup work to receive credit. Feel free to complete makeup work. So really kind of going through your language and see how uh, you can make it so that you're not assuming that the student is going to do it wrong, going to do it badly, or not capable. All right, learning outcomes. These have become something like my little soapbox. I'm really enjoying them. They are essential to the course. What's the purpose? What are we trying to do here in a course? And articulating this uh, clearly in a student-centered way using verbs and so that you know you can measure it. These are, this is key and there are, um, if you want more information, if you want to work sort of specifically on your course, I'd be happy to work with you, as would other folks in the TLTC as well. Um, but this is a big deal because it also sometimes takes some thinking on our part. Here is, and I do have this uh, as a handout, and I can pop that in the chat in the moment. Um, this came out of a book called Learning That Matters. Um, and it is a really clear chart. I hope you can read it and I will get into the chat. 
um, aligning the verbs, what you want students to do with the assessment tasks that would be allow you to measure what you're wanting them to learn and to demonstrate. So um, let me get that for you and pop that into the chat. Coming through. Come on, honey. And if, uh, let me know if you can. All right, there it's up. Nice. So now you can pull it up on your own and look at it a little bit larger. But this came out of learning that matters. Excellent. Thank you. Um, but really thinking through how you're going to measure what you're measuring and making sure that the students understand why you're doing what you're doing. All right. <laughs> I just said that. So the purpose of a project, the skills you want your students to practice, the content knowledge you're going to gain from going through this process, and then contextualizing what you're doing. This is this project makes sense in this place, in this course for these reasons, in the larger curriculum that you're in, in your college education and kind of things that you're going to use beyond college, but really helping students think about what they're doing in a larger context. You should always say, you know, what they need to do and how they need to do it, recommended steps. Sometimes a big project is completely overwhelming. I know that I do that and I have to break things down for myself. Um, and that's important. And then the criteria that will they'll know that the project's uh, finished and um, a checklist to help them stay on track. And this is I will also pop this into the chat. Um, this is a, a checklist and let me know if that comes through uh, for a transparent project checklist and not everything is going to be appropriate to every discipline but it's really helpful because there are assumptions we make particularly as content experts um, that students don't make and so it's not clear to them and we don't even know it's not clear to them so this is a way to help that but also, we all go over our projects, but not being, I teach my students a lot to uh, talk, to ask clarifying questions. So even if they feel like it's a dumb question, it's like, no, it's a clarifying question. And the example I always use is, I'm, we're going to do the red project. Rhea, are we using red? As a matter of fact, it's complementary. So we're going to be using red and green. That's a good question. And it would have seemed like a dumb question, but it's not. It's a clarifying question and it actually gets them more information. So um, encouraging that. So here's an example of language. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to let you read it. And I do have a list of sources at the end. Um, this will be on the recording, but I can also, uh, what I tend to do in these things is screenshot this sort of stuff. So I have that sort of information later. I don't remember what's on this next slide. Oh yes, this. This was pretty beautiful. Hold on, I'm going to unshare and then reshare a window. Did I unshare? Still looks shared to me. Okay. How do I unshare? Go back to the share button. Yeah. 
I did. And what did it say? Let me try this. There you go. That worked. All right. So um, this link is um, in the PowerPoint, and I can also put it in the chat in a moment. But this is a really beautiful um, equity-minded syllabus. Um, and each one, you can click on all of them. It goes through page by page, deals with welcoming, This is just a really beautiful, high tech, piece by piece, thoughtful syllabus. And what I liked about it as well is that visually it's nicely designed. There's white space, there's clarity, um, and it goes through each page. Let's see if I can get it to the next page. That's here. Nope. There it is. So this I would recommend you spending some time with because visually it's clear, but it also really talks about um, each aspect of why they're doing what they're doing to make this an equity-minded, welcoming uh, syllabus. Did you put the link in? I don't see it yet. I will do that right this moment. Thank you. There you go. Perfect, thank you. All right, so I am gonna go back to one more thing in my presentation. Yeah, that one is worth spending some time with on your own. I found it quite lovely. I just want to say uh, Kim recommended this book to me and I looked into it and we'll be doing this as a professional learning community uh, this fall. It's written by a chemistry professor um, and she's worked out uh, ways of incorporating uh, study and learning skills for students into a course so it doesn't dominate the content but supports students learning. So keep that in mind for this fall. And these are the sources that I was um, working from. Uh, Designing a Motivational Syllabus. The Learning That Matters course is really outstanding. I got to do a, a work book group with the authors this last spring and it was that's just a treasure trove of information. Radical Hope is my current favorite inspirational book. It changed how I wrote syllabi. Um, the other two are I have um, our websites that I've been using. So I'm going to stop do uh, don't hesitate to screenshot this so that you have these links. And then when I get a wave, we'll be posting your PowerPoint to access your sources. Uh, that's a good question. I can share it, absolutely. Or Diana can help me post it in an appropriate way. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing if it will let me. It won't let me. How do I stop sharing? Last time it let me share something else. There we go. Whoop. I think Ed did that. Okay, thanks Ed. Appreciate that. It wouldn't let me get out of there. Don't know what I was doing. <laughs> Good. So that was a fair bit of information relatively quickly. Um, I would encourage you to just 
start by taking a look at your syllabus and thinking about it as a welcome letter to your students that clarifies what you're going to be doing together, how you're going to be doing it. Thanks, Ed. And how to make sure that we are welcoming our students back to campus, back into classrooms, and uh, back to a more normal learning environment in a way that sort of acknowledges the fact that this year's been insane, but that always welcomes everybody. All right. Questions, comments, and yes, I will post the PowerPoint wherever Diana tells me to. <laughs> I have a question. Um, we'll probably get something like this, I would imagine, come August, but I'm I'm worried about the students who are coming back that may not be super comfortable being in the group settings or the classroom settings, especially close together in a lab. Um, so is there some kind of wording we can put on our syllabus that says, you know, if, if if you're in a situation that's uncomfortable based on closeness and all of that because of COVID, you know, like, come to me, tell me about it and we'll figure something out. I feel like that's something that should be on a very welcoming syllabus because we are, you know, understanding that we are all readapting to a more in-person situation. So if you had any thoughts or if anybody has any thoughts or tips on that, that would be great. Actually, I think your wording just this moment was pretty fantastic. Um, but being honest, like it, we're just, we're all coming out of a strange situation, and it's going to be uncomfortable. Please come talk to me if you know you're feeling awkward, and and we'll figure this out. But even just addressing it in your first class period, mm -hmm. you know, and you haven't been on our campus at the beginning of a normal semester yet. But um, there's always you get one group the first class period and your second class period there's been some shuffle so you kind of end up having to repeat some things and mm -hmm. I think that is something that is worth repeating more than even more than that those couple of times because it is it's going to be a transition and they take time and we really need to acknowledge that and I think a lot of us have gotten very good at checking in with our students online it's not something to leave out of in-person classes how are you doing how was your weekend how did you know? How did the project go? What you know? What went well? What didn't? And and lead it into that. But but checking in and and acknowledging it's going to be awkward and weird is for real. That's a good thing to think about for sure. Mm -hmm. Someone's got their hand up. Who's that? I think that's oh, me. Oh, yes, it oh, is. Yeah. Hey, yeah. So Ria, first of all, thank you so much for uh, this. Uh, like like a. a a discussion based on this subject because I've been wondering about this subject for the longest of times that I've seen syllabi that have been just like that are just like so gloriously put together that I just like they, they are almost like works of art and I've seen the other side um, of of you know just throwing a bunch of stuff together um, and I probably fall in that <laughs> in that category but uh, but I think as I was <coughs> uh, um, um, as I was hearing you, it, it makes a lot of sense, and I do have a lot of language in my in my uh, in my syllabus that always says, you know, talk to me. I'm here to help you. I'm here to make sure you succeed in this course, etc. But uh, I want to kind of ask like a devil's advocate type type of a question here, uh, because um, you know, all through my grad school, and especially as a as an international uh, student of color, and now a professional of, uh, professor of color who is here on a working visa, right? Um, I look and, and this is like full disclosure, like I look at my syllabus as um, as 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 a wall that I can hide behind if there is unjust uh, requests or a student is, is trying to, you know, arm twist me into something. Right. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure everyone sort of uh, knows what I'm talking about. Um, so if I start kind of talking about my course policy as course values or, or course plans. Um, the so the 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 you know the contractual element to that conversation is compromised, which is what we are trying to do really. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's this other component of that. Like I take refuge in the fact that I have written on my syllabus that you've got to contact me within seven days of an assignment being given by to, being given to you 
if you have to appeal that assignment. So, um, so I guess what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to ask is like, how do we balance this out um, um, in, in, in a real life situation? Sorry for this long winded question, but I think I, I, but, but I, but I hope you get me. Yes, I do. And it is, it's different writing a syllabus when you have tenure than when you don't. And that's the other thing. Um, but I think we can use language that centers the student, welcomes them in and says, this is what I'm going to be doing and why I'm doing this. And this is what I expect from you. And I think you're ready for this. You know what I mean? Instead of saying, if you do this wrong, that will happen. You can say, I need to, you know, if you're going to, you know, I need to receive right. any questions within seven days so that I have time to respond. Um, what was it that Greg said earlier that he's like, if things are late, you don't get feedback, but if they're on time, you do. Yeah. I, think I thought like that, that was really smart mm -hmm. right. because if they want, because if they want to improve a grade, they're going to need that feedback. But I think it's a matter of, I mean, when I first started, it was like the syllabus is a contract between you and your students. And exactly, that yeah. is, um, this isn't a legal arrangement. Um, syllabi are not binding legal contracts. They are places of clarity so that everybody in this learning community knows who's responsible to do what and how I'm going to help you get where you need to go. So I think absolutely work with other folks within your discipline, but also you're welcome to come to the faculty center to say, this is what I need them to know. How do I say it in a way that helps them get where they're supposed to go without saying, don't do this, don't do that. You can't do this, you can't do that. Because that, I, it was a great phrase. There was a long discussion in the pod network listserv um, about uh, the language in a syllabus and um, one, quote that came through was who wants to learn what a dog can teach from a dog that's always threatening to bite <laughs> i thought that was pretty funny but you know i think you do, we do need to be clear what our expectations are and why we have those expectations um but we can also say it in a way that doesn't say i expect you to do this wrong and so i'm saying this do you know what i mean does that make sense? Yes, I do. Is that I do. helpful? Yes, it does make, so make a lot of it makes a lot of sense. I mean, also like if if you look at syllabus as a contractual kind of a document, and uh, I mean, I, I would plead guilty uh, in in composing a syllabus like that for the very reason that I was saying. Um, it also is is fairly like stupidifying. Like you, <laughs> the, the student, it, it it apparently looks like the student just cannot make any sense of anything. So everything has to be spelled down in up utmost detail, and you know. Um, um, very very you know black and white so i get right. that idea but i do also understand and appreciate that you say that uh, there's a certain uh, i mean tenured and tenure track people would be would 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 lie would write syllabi differently i mean i i definitely want to have this in my syllabus that you know if you have if you think i've, I've not graded you right come to me in a week come to me in two weeks and that's fine but don't come to me like when I'm two days before I'm entering my final grades. I'm about yeah. to grade. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. And it's legit to put in there, you know, it, it's staying on track. There was that example of staying on track is less stressful for you. But it also you could put in there. It helps me keep up with my grading if everybody gets everything in on time. Right. And then I can get you feedback in time to help you learn. That makes sense. So, you know, putting yourself in there in a way that says, you know, I, I have responsibilities too and I'll step up to them, but I can't do them if you don't do yours. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that yeah. that absolutely makes sense. Sure. Thanks, Rev. It's very helpful. Cool. But the, the thinking about uh, contracts, there are um, policies that are links on our website on uh, the Sony Oneonta website, so that you don't have to put in all of the policies in your syllabus. You can say, here are important um, college policies uh, for you to know about, and then you just label them. Here's, you know, about ADA compliance, here's about grade grievances, here's about uh, academic integrity, and you can just list them at the end of your syllabus, and you don't have to write it all out, and you don't have to come down. This information is available, here's how you access it. Here's information on the Student Learning Center. You, I would put that 
higher up and in larger type or something. Here's ways of getting support when you're struggling. Contact me, contact our TA, contact, you know, those sorts of uh, support, access to support should be highlighted in my mind, but also just access to all the policies that students are going to need um, if they have questions. Uh, so, but you don't have to spell it all out. That's why we get to put it on, uh, on the website. Okay, curious about where this misconception came from about the contrast being a legal contract. Yeah, I don't know, but I remember hearing it. Um, 12 pages, it's interesting. In the research that I did, I, that they found that 60% of students prefer a longer syllabus because then they can go refer to it when they need to. Now, we say to a lot, oh my God, they never read the syllabus, but how many students actually ask that or is it the same six? Lots of students do go back and look things up and they actually, once they understand that the syllabus is a welcoming, useful document, they're gonna be more likely to refer to it and they do actually prefer it when it's thorough and they've got information in it. Uh, and I was surprised by that because I always thought I'd had to keep mine down to like four or five pages, but they were saying like, no, nine to 12 is fine and students like when they have information. And I was surprised by that myself. Oh, Kim, that's fun. So the normal long one and a short infographic one. So they've got like a quick reference guide kind of. Yeah, yeah. And like I just I was like, I want to make an infographic syllabus. And I was like, too much stuff. So it's like I'll make an infographic of just like the key things they need to know right away. But then also be like, but here's the link to the full one. If you need like full explanations about all the different like what all the categories are like, does everyone need online homework explained? Probably not. But not right now, but at least you need to know like the course components and all that stuff. So that way they had both options. And I think that made it a little bit easier. And then I could reference like, here's the main thing. And then here's like something else. And then I had that how to succeed in the class thing, which was awesome. So I didn't have to keep telling them like, are you doing the daily things? Are you doing the weekly things? Are you doing the things for the exam? They were like laid out of like what they should like do for each of these moments for the ideal scenario. And I was like, I know this is ideal. You may not do this every time, but if you're struggling, maybe try to do some of these things. So I think that was really helpful. Excellent. Yes, infographic skills. I want those too, because I have not done that. I do, my, my infographic is all like drawn and take a picture. Like, you know, it's not like on digital infographics. I am definitely not bragging. I just started doing it this semester, which so I'm just excited that, that I started doing it and I just barely did anything. So I'm just like still excited about it. So what are you using? I, don't, I just use PowerPoint. I try to like use like whatever. What's the one that everybody uses? Um, it has a name that I can't. Canva. It's like a little short name. Yeah, Canvas or Canva or whatever. And I was like, looked at it. and I was like, those are cool. And I was like, but I don't want to pay for it. And I don't want to get into like it's so complicated. So I was like, I just looked at those and was like, I'll make that on PowerPoint. And I just made it on PowerPoint. I have to do very visual things for my job anyway. So I'm like, eh, I can figure it out. So I just did that. Yes, that is the, Antoine, to answer your question, that is the standard syllabus that needs to be A to A compliant, and that's the template to use. What she's talking about is having a secondary infographic that's an overview of quick first things to grab and with links to that syllabus. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yes, that is absolutely required, and that's the ADA compliant one. Yes, you're right. But we're we're talking about fun visuals because <laughs> some of us like to do this. <laughs> Other questions, comments. You know, you could pull up your own syllabus and just say, what kind of language am I doing? And I've got to say, I'm gonna do it again. I have had this thing about this book. Um To pop it into the chat again. Who's the speed typist? Oh, it's Kim. I'm so sorry, my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I read this the Radical Hope book. I read it twice in a couple of weeks last fall, and it I rewrote my syllabi right there because it is. I found it so inspiring. Um, I'd be curious what other people think. I'm hoping to do a PLC on this as well. We should have two running this fall. See how many things I can juggle at once. Um, 
But this is a quick read. This is 150 pages. It's written like someone is speaking to you. And I just found it super inspiring. And it is, it talks about syllabi and it talks about uh, centering the students in their own education and empowering them to do that and helping them feel empowered so that they can. What other things um, do you do in your syllabus that you think are successful or that you're not sure about? So pull up a syllabus, take a look and tell me what you're thinking. If you were a student and you were walking in to see it the first time, this would be really fun if we could do this in person and we could exchange syllabi and read a syllabus in somebody else's discipline that you're completely unfamiliar with. That would be interesting. Oh, that sounds like a workshop. If anybody's into it, we could do that. Because I am so familiar with art ones that, you know, I read them all the time. I read other people's, but um, we can do it on Teams. It's we true. Can. I like that. I rearranged mine one year because I was like, I was trying to be like, what are they really looking for that they want to have on the first page? Because I was like, I always talk about the introductory, like, here's all the textbook stuff and like all that. And I'm like, I mean, they probably already have the textbook by the time they get to class, so they don't need that as much. It can be in there, but so the first page is like, how is your grade going to be decided? What are the main activities? Because that's the thing they're really like, but what are the grades? And I'm like, yeah, okay. So I put those first and then move the other stuff sort of around a little bit. But I think it'd be interesting to ask them, like, what questions do you normally have about it? And like, just put those in the front and then that makes it easier too. Or you can have an infographic. Now I have that, I guess. Yeah, and I think because we have the syllabus template they're, they're asking us to use, yeah, we should true. use that. But that's, that infographic is sort of, this is this, this is their formal syllabus. It's welcoming, it's clear, it's got the rubrics, it's got the percentages, it's got all of that information. But if you, it would be very cool actually to start a class with your first class. Okay, prepare the syllabus because we're gonna make an infographic for us okay. in our first class period with what's important and what are you going to want to refer to? So they have to have read the syllabus, know what their questions are and say, okay, if I were going to refer to this, these are the things that I want first. And then you could build the infographic together. And that would be helpful for me because then it's probably some student is way better in like in design and they'd do it for me. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. But that would require them to, it's called code construction. It would require them to say what's important to them and what's, what is the information that they think they're going to need and helps them say, wait a minute, I, I, I'm an active participant here. So yeah, collaboratively building the infographic, that would be fun. My art students would all be like, oh, I've got digital art students. They would do it digitally and then I've got the rest of us would be with like our colored pencils, but that could be fun to do. <laughs> But yeah, thinking about a syllabus of yours, how does it come across like it's you that wrote it? Does it have you in it? It should center the student, but we're all in this because we like to teach. I mean, we're, we're, we're not here because we're becoming millionaires. Um, we're here because we are totally engaged in our subject matter and we want to teach. Does that show in the syllabus. No, when I, I started. Yes. Go ahead. I was just going to say that I think mine has like slowly improved over time. The more I go to these professional development style programs, the, the nicer my syllabus gets, as in kind words, niceness. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to share that I added, and I'm pretty sure it was because of you know one of these programs that we did in August, is somebody mentioned course expectations, especially going into the hybrid learning COVID time where I put like, I expect that the students will do this and then this is what the students can expect of me. And that really helped with, you know, when they, they stopped getting cranky if I didn't answer their emails at 1130 at night about the homework that was due at midnight because I was up front and said, if you need homework help, you know, you got to ask me earlier than five minutes before it's due. Um, so just adding a few of those bullet points, I think it really helped and it made the students more aware of, of me and my abilities and what I expected of them. Yeah, and one thing that I'm seeing more and more often is some people say the student should, and some people are switching it over to you. They're just writing to the student. This is what um, I hope that you will accomplish. 
This is what your responsibilities are. And this is what I hope to accomplish. And this is what my responsibilities are, or these are my goals for you. What are your goals for you? And then I, I do this whole thing with, for my advanced students with a journaling. So my goals for you is that you learn how to ask questions of yourself and keep yourself rolling and know how to build a community and of artists. And these are my goals for you, but what are your goals for you? Let's develop that, you know, what do you need? So, um, but really speaking to them as a, as a person, as an individual, rather than this like amorphous, the student. Who, me? Right. But yeah, syllabi are absolutely evolving documents as you evolve as a faculty member, as our students change. I think this is the possibly the fourth kind of major cohort that I've taught since I've been here. I've been here 13 years. But what students' expectations are, what skills they bring with them, how they communicate, there are radically different cohorts over the years. And so our syllabi need to reflect that and respond to wherever they are. And uh, so, yeah, I keep fussing with the document always. Can I ask a dumb question? Ed. When you were teaching history, did you hand out syllabi to your high school students? Um, when we started the course, we did not have a syllabus, but we did have a course expectation sheet. And often the course expectation sheets um, needed to be signed by the student and their parent. And often we gave broad grading paradigms in that sheet, but not specifics. So for example, it might say, oh, my course is gonna be 60% test grades and 20% quizzes, and you'll find out more details about that as we go through the semester. My course will have homework two to three nights a week, and here are, and, and, and this is what's typical in my class. Uh, faculty with parents, or with the fa faculty with parents, faculty with kids. Is that about what you get with from your own children in you know middle school or high school? Yeah, uh, I just threw a yeah. comment in the chat. That's exactly what we have. I mean, just that that kind of broad. These are our expectations. This is what you need to do, and and that's really it. Nothing specific beyond that. So. And usually, it's like a welcome letter to your class. Here, tell. Here's a little bit about me. Here's what we're going to be doing. It's it's kind of the the introduction to me as the instructor, and, and that's one of the things I've always said about college and the transition between high school and being a uh, middle school or high school teacher and and, uh, and coming into college is I'm always in awe of people who can plan a full year ahead of time or a full semester ahead of time because in in high school you know if you were you know had a broad pacing guide. And then we're one week ahead of your students. You were doing great. Oh, I have spent semesters a week ahead when I, as a part time faculty, would get handed a course two days before it started. You can teach this, right? Yeah, sure, I can teach it. What's the title? You know, like <laughs> I need the cash, I'll figure it out. And um, yeah, no, I've, I've spent entire semesters going, okay, I got to practice this technique because I'm teaching it tomorrow. So now that I teach the courses more often, I'm a little farther ahead. But it's uh, it's I think so students now are more at ease with and expecting here are my expectations for you. Here's an introduction to me rather than I mean, yes, it gets signed, but it didn't sound like it had a contractual tone to it. It was more of a welcome letter and an establishing of expectations in a in a kind of pretty positive way. So I think that's an important thing to know that students are not, because I never had that as a kid, but they do now. And so that's not unheard of to our students. So that's a good thing to know. Other ideas. If you were walking into a college classroom, pick a discipline in your head you are completely unfamiliar with and if you were going to walk into that college classroom what would you want as that first introduction like if i walked into a chemistry class i have not had chemistry since i was in 11th grade if i walked into a chemistry class 
I would be chewing my lip scared. <laughs> Physics, has, I might be. What? It has a reputation. <laughs> right. But Especially organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is not everyone's favorite thing. Right. But it's a super significant discipline to so many other disciplines. So how do you help the students get, get in, get comfortable, get what they need, understand it as part of the context? You know, so what are, what are the things that you would want? I want to know where I can get extra help. Yeah. Yes, and that's yeah. a really important thing to set up in the syllabus. Absolutely. Here's all the resources. Yeah, that's good. I put a little thing, a little snippet of like what people have said about the course in the past. Like Avisa had asked them, but then I was like, can I put your comments in there? I was like, this is really hard, but I learned to do things on my own or like, this is how I did it. Like, and then that, that kind of helps because it's like, oh, other people are talking to me and it's from students because they don't listen to me, but they listen to them, I feel like. So they have a little, like a little snippet of like, is this flip class? Is it going to be scary? And it's like, here's what people say about the flip classroom in this class. And then it's like, oh, okay. So maybe that makes it feel better. I mean, obviously I'm cherry picking, but still. Wanting to know that the professor will be there for you. Yes. If you have questions, here's how to reach me. Here's like Valerie said, here are the expectations. I, I'm really clear with my students. I don't answer emails on Saturday and Sunday. Monday morning though, I'm on it. But after about five o'clock on Friday, um, I'm not there, sorry. And but if you've got questions, hammer me during the week. I'm on email all the time. So that kind of clarity of when are you available for help and that you're available to help them. And I always say, like, I like email questions. I was like, I'm pretty good at answering questions on email because then it's like they're not waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden they're panicky when they ask. I'm like, please just send it whenever. I may not answer it right away, but I'll answer it. And I'm usually pretty good, but I always say, take a picture. Cause if you don't take a picture, I have no idea what you're talking about. They're like on assignment 27. Cause I have a zillion practice sheets. They're not for grades. Um, I'm like, I don't have that right now. And if I look at it on my phone, it's too tiny and I can't see it. So I was like, if you see me a picture of what you have, I can answer it in five seconds. But if you don't, it may take a while. I'll answer it. It'll just take longer. Gotcha. I always tell them to do that. Ah, specific goals, Ed. So you have you 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 might have goals for yourself. What are the goals for the the course? What are the faculty's goals for the student? Like being clear on what those what are we aiming for here anyways? Why are we doing this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could see my I mean, as a UP member, I get one free class a year, right? What if I decide to join a digital art class cuz I want to learn to infographic good? Right. That's I, I want to I, I want to be in a digital art class because I want I want to do some of that, you know, fun stuff. And that's my goal. But if I walk into that class and the instructor's goals for me are more about analysis of digital art and I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine how their learning goals might be so different that my goals might be offensive to them because I'm here for fun. Right. Like, imagine that, where there was such a, a preconceived notion in my head about what I wanted to do, that it's actually so different that I, that I would feel like I was offending or annoying the professor. But if that expectation is, here's what we're doing and here's what it means to be successful, is right up front, I'm like, oh, I understand here. Okay, that's kind of cool. Right, and that is, and it's interesting because, yeah, art classes get that. I've had a student say, this was too much work. I took this class to relax. And I'm like, well, there's lots of things you can do to relax, but I don't generally sign up for a course to relax. Uh, it's a college level design class <laughs> and we have specific. And if you're here to relax, I would say take this box of supplies and have a really good time because there's lots of fun stuff to play in here, but don't sign up for the class because <laughs> we've got we've got other goals. So having those up front so you can say, yeah, we're going to be doing infographics. It's a quarter of the class and the other three quarters are going to be covering web design, an introduction to, you know, animation. And you'd be like, oh, OK, now I know. But yeah, that would actually be in graphic design. Info infographics are in graphic design. And I totally want to take that class too. So yeah, Valerie, what other courses, what other knowledge is expected or will be reviewed? Or if they don't feel like they have it, how do they get that help? Right. Like, 
Yeah, because some some of the classes that you've mentioned, you know, are, are really obvious what you need to know and what you're going to do. But intro astronomy, for example, has a reputation of it can be really easy and fun. Like we're going to learn the constellations and look at the stars or you could do all of the math associated with the stars. So they want to know like where on the spectrum on the scale is it going to be? Yeah, so that kind of clarity and not making assumptions about what mm -hmm. they do and do not know. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had I've had students come to intro astronomy and, and get upset that we're not talking about zodiac signs and what their future is gonna be like. Yeah, oh, it's dear. fun times. <laughs> <laughs> but that's but that's on me to explain to them like this is what astronomy versus astrology is now you know the difference and now you know what you signed up for so either drop the class now or get ready to learn astronomy right let's be clear exactly <laughs> yep exactly and yeah, I bet you every once in a while you get one kid who gets hooked on it it's like oh man this is really the interesting stuff like mm -hmm. that was kind of fun but this is like what actually happens and how it works and yeah yeah Nice, nice, nice. So I want to make the offer again. If you're working on your syllabus and you want to chat with other folks, please come talk to me. And if people are interested in a workshop of just trading around syllabi and talking, reading syllabi that are unfamiliar to you so you can get a sense of, because sometimes some things that other faculty do in their syllabi are like, oh my God, I'm totally stealing that. That is really smart. Or if this were me and I walked into your class, I wouldn't know what that means. That can be really helpful feedback. So if people are interested, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but also, if you just want some feedback, please let me know in the Faculty Center. That's what we're there for. <laughs> A PhD in astrology. I bet you there's a place you could do that. Excellent. Excellent. I like 